Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So friends, uh, welcome back to the understanding of rural uh, sociology and uh, here basically uh, we are moving towards the advancement with regard to the understanding of the present society. Uh, we have talked about the present society in the uh, first unit and here uh, we are basically dealing with uh, the third component and in this uh, third component of present movement in India we are basically trying to speak about uh, the chapter 13th that is speaking about the new farmers movement. Uh, new farmers movement is going to be a critical issue when we try to see the transition of the rural society because this understanding about the farmers movement tries to put the rural into another platform and we try to see that the drastic interventions which has happened in the rural is basically leading to the transformation of the rural society. So when we speak about the farmers movement, we basically try to mean that the rural society is, which was seen as the silent, the docile or which was basically seen as uh, unchanging or unreactionary. Now, we try to see that rural also has the power of resistance, the power of resistance. And in that way, we try to see that the rural definitely is marked by the population which are not the silent listeners or they are not the people who are seen as uh, the object, rather they are to be seen as a subject. And when we try to see them as subject, definitely the issue of uh, the farmer movements come into the picture. And here we try to see that the rural is not simply seen as the entity which was limited to its own domain, rather we try to see that how it has its connect with the outside world, especially we try to see the two categories, one of course is the market and another of course is the state. So we try to see that uh, not only the question of market comes into the picture. But we also try to see that the state, how the state was trying to intervene and trying to put a pressure on the so called uh, rural society, but the farmers movement is trying to give a new color towards the understanding of uh, the rural society. So in that way we try to see that uh, one thing which we have to analyze in this particular understanding is that we will try to speak about minor distinction which is there between the present movement and a shift that is taking place towards the farmers that is the farmer movement. So the transition has to be seen, uh, we already have discussed the various present movement which took place in the Indian society in the previous unit, but here we are trying to see the present movement in terms of a new transition and in that we try also will try to see that how the present movement are to be seen differently and uh, the farmers movement are to be seen as distinct from the present movement. And here I think uh, if we try to name a few, uh, we have uh, the understanding about the BKU movement, the Shetkari, the Shetkari movement that is another important issue in that sense, the Shetkari Sangathan movement and also we try to see the role of KRRS movement. So, these are certain uh, crucial farmers movement which reflect upon the understanding about the rural society in terms of uh, putting challenges and also bringing about the new conditionality to the rural society. Now to begin with, uh, we try to see that when we try to speak about the various farmers movement in India, we also try to see that uh, there are specific typologies of the cultivators that has to be seen in terms of transition. We are also trying to see the sort of an agrarian unrest which is going to be an important issue 
with regard to the rural India. And then we also will try to highlight what is the meaning of the farmers movement. Meaning of the farmers movement and then we also will try to highlight the class dimension of the <coughs> farmer movement. So, there are various ways in which we can interpret this chapter especially we try to even see the farmers movement in the era of globalization, how the globalization is going to affect the farmers or how the farmers are going to take the advantage of the globalization in order to make their appeal more wider and stronger. So, we try to see that uh, this chapter basically tries to throw upon the changes which are there in the society. The agrarian society of India which was been seen as cultural led society and we try to see that cultural values are going to be more prominent and we have the understanding in terms of harmonious setting and also the specific social order which is to be put into a harmony. So, we have the cooperation, we have the harmony which was the reflection of the rural society. But when we try to speak about the exogenous forces, exogenous forces of change, either it is the question of the state intervention or it is the question of the market or if it is the question of the international organization. I think these exogenous forces has resulted into the mobilization of the rural society and since the shift has taken place in the rural society in terms of the habitants, we try to speak about uh, the peasantry at the initial phase, but through time we try to see that how the shift has taken place in the setting in terms of a shift from the peasant to the farmers and we try to find out that peasant movements which have been an important variant of the social movements. Now, we have to see that they had the specific ideological specific ideological grounding or the orientations and now we try to see that uh, they have become more radical and we try to see that these radical aspects are to be seen in terms of the institutional framework that there is certain amount of institutionalization. So, the peasant movements which were based on the specific ideological framework to some extent and now we try to see that the farmer movements which are seen as more radical and they are basically trying to understand the society in terms of the charged rural environment and this charged rural environment has its bearing from the past history and this past history definitely is full of uh, the so called revolutions, the movements which have happened either it is the question of uh, the freedom struggle or is it the question of fighting against the state at certain period of time, but we try to see that there is a drastic change which has taken place with regard to the understanding of the rural society. Especially when we try to speak about the sort of differentiation which has taken place in the peasantry, either that has been talked about by people like Mayo or we have Lenin or we try to see people who have contributed towards the differentiation of the peasantry, we try to find out that their contribution is quite significant because they were trying to speak about that how the peasantry has shown their presence in the capitalistic era. And uh, when we try to see the peasantry in the capitalistic era, gradually we try to also make a shift in terms of uh, their orientation like the peasant as we talked about were basically meant for their own subsistence. But when we try to come down to the understanding of farmers as has been talked about by Eric Wolf, uh, he was trying to speak about that profit making for them is going to be important or their relationship with the market with the outside world that is going to be important for understanding the notion of farmers. Similarly, Robert Redfield also has spoken about the connectivity of the peasant in terms of the farmers when their identification and their 
understanding has to be seen with the wider context. So, we try to see that uh, especially when we have the 1960s and the 70s era uh, in the world, we try to speak about that there were various present studies. But as we make a shift, especially when we try to speak about in social sciences from the viewpoint of Latin America or for that sake if you try to see the Asia, Africa and Europe, we try to find out that there was a drastic change towards the interpretation and understanding about the present studies. And here I think uh, the Bretton Woods experiment, uh, uh, Bretton Woods experiment that happened with regard to 1970s which was seen as a big collapse in terms of the exchange of the rate system and that has thrown more light towards how the capital movements can have certain amount of grounding. So, we have now the transnational network, transnational network which is basically adding to the flavor of uh, the new form of connectivity with the small agriculturalist. So, it is not simply the question of uh, that the market is the only way in which we can make the distinction between the peasant and the farmers, but also we try to see the transnational networks are also trying to add to or trying to provide a link to the small agriculturist and their connectivity to the outside world. So, basically we try to see that in the late 1980s and 90s, we try to speak about that how there was a been transition in the uh, Europe and in North America and which basically has led to the emergence of the farmer movements in a new way. And that particular thing are basically been seen as what you can say the militant farmer movement, the militant farmer movement that happens to be more prime and we try to see it was having certain amount of politicization of the middle peasantry. politicization of the middle peasantry which has given a new shape towards the understanding of the farmers movement. And in that context I think uh, uh, we have uh, multiple ways in which we try to see that how the farmers have tried to show their presence either if you try to see in terms of uh, the contribution of uh, the resistance which has come from the N30, N30 countries. So, the N30 countries they have shown high level of resistance to the WTO where the protest was from the peasants and the farmers from the third world countries and they were basically trying to uh, provide a new setting. They were uh, basically trying to have the presence felt in terms of that how their understanding or how their concern are going to be taken to the first level rather than trying to see that it is going to be hegemonized by the outside world. So, we try to see that the so called peasant movements which have been in the transition has been impeded or it has been forced and has been changed towards uh, the wider understanding especially with the end of uh, the so called uh, uh, the capitalistic era and we are moving towards the global era where we have number of connectivity. We have the activities from GATT or from WTO uh, which has shown the high level of resistance from the different countries. Basically, we are trying to speak about the developing and the underdeveloped countries which has basically shown the high amount of resistance to uh, these sort of movement. And the peasant movement if you try to see, I think uh, the peasant movements were a bit localized, they were having the specific issues, the issues which were more to be seen in terms of the specific orientation, they were to be seen with regard to the land or they were to be seen in terms of the land tenure system. Because if you try to see these understandings especially when we try to speak about the Indian context, we try to find out that uh, lot many present movement have taken place which we have discussed earlier. Either it is the question of the Tibhaka movement or we try to speak about the Telangana movement and also we try to see the contemporary movement which is going on that is the next light movement. 
So, I think uh, these various movements uh, they try to be seen in terms of present movement, but uh, on the contrary if you try to speak about the shift which has taken place, we try to find out that these present movements either it is Tebhaga, Telangana or Nexalite, their basic grounding was with regard to the analysis of uh, the agrarian structure. the problems associated with the agrarian structures and also we try to see that the land distribution, the land tenure were seen the main reasons for the conflicts between the classes, especially if you try to see it in terms of the peasantry versus the landlords. So, I think uh, this is basically a historical setting in which the peasant movements have been uh, visualized and has been fashioned. On the contrary, if you try to see the farmers movement, so the farmers movement speaks about or it can be located as the new social movement. So, we try to see that the farmers movement are basically seen as the new social movement and the reason being that uh, why they were the new social movement because of their appeal, because of their concern and also because of their participation. So, we try to see that uh, a specific movement why it can be seen as a new social movement especially if we have to uh, see it in terms of Alan Turin who tries to speak about uh, the understanding of the new social movement and it has been said that the, the new social movement demonstrate that the class has become redundant, the class has become redundant and we try to speak about as an organized form of social identity, organized form of social identity which is going to give certain amount of action in terms of mobilization. So, we try to see that uh, in spite of class we try to see it in terms of uh, a force towards or a movement towards the social identity. We also try to see that the modern society which has been marked by the participation across the caste these things are going to be important and in that context I think uh, what is more appealing is that when we try to speak about the new social movements, they are to be seen as those movements which are going to have the wider appeal and the concerns for everybody. And in that category, we can have the various new social movements like the environmental movement come into that category or we try to see the gender concern which is again seen as the important aspect of the new social movement and similarly, we try to locate the farmers movement as the new social movement. So, we have to see that what is the new in the new social movement uh, that has to be understood because uh, this has basically has its effect in Indian society basically in 1970s we try to see the emergence of uh, the so called new farmers movement. Maharashtra has uh, shown its uh, uh, cause then you have Uttar Pradesh and also we have Karnataka which has shown the wide level of participation and mobilization of the farmers movement. So, we try to see that uh, these states Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, even Gujarat for that sake they have shown high level of resistance on certain issues and what was that issue? The issues were basically the prices. So, it is basically the prices of the food grains that becomes a crucial issue and that is where we try to see that uh, the farmers are basically concerned about having a control over the food prices which are to be fixed by the state. So, we try to see that these sort of uh, movements are basically seen as sort of uh, what you can say the rural agitations and these rural agitations are not seen in terms of a party, they are to be seen in terms of non-party alignment. 
So, we have the non party alignment in terms of the rural agitation which is across the uh, society not based on a specific ideology and we try to see that here the farmers were more important, the peasants were not going to be uh, that important. By that we mean to say that uh, what is going to be important when we try to speak about the farmers movement, it is basically the fixing of the procurement price. Then we try to speak about the remunerative prices the remunerative prices that are going to be important and apart from that we have the prices of the agricultural inputs prices of the agricultural inputs that is going to be important and apart from that certain other issues which are incorporated is the electricity charges we also include the question of uh, the irrigation prices, the irrigation charges. So, these are the what you can say concerns or these were the issues which are going to be important when we try to speak about the farmers movement. So, here if you try to see neither the land nor the land tenure is going to be an important issue. It was also not based on a specific caste, it was not seen on a specific political line, rather it was basically seen as a movement which tries to address to the various class to the various categories. And we try to see that uh, in the old issues if you try to see, the old issues basically include the notion of land to the tillers that is the land grant is going to be an important issue and along with that we have the tenancy reforms. The tenancy reforms which is going to be an important issue. Then also we have the question of land redistribution. So, uh, these were certain crucial issues uh, which has been part and parcel of the present movement. So, these issues were more involved when we try to see the present movement, but in the farmers movement I think uh, these issues are going to be important. So, we try to see a drastic shift in terms of the issues, in terms of the concerns which are going to be important when we try to see that uh, the farmers movements are going to be the new social movements. And if you try to see that shift, it is basically that we have a shift from the so called institutional arrangement towards the technological arrangements. So, we have a shift from institutional arrangement towards the technological arrangement and we try to see that uh, with the advancement of the development especially the capitalistic crisis which happened in the 1990s and the bearing of that has basically led to the concern for the social welfare and also the state which was gradually becoming weaker in that capitalistic competition because now you have the global players which are coming into the picture. So, in that global scenario when the state is going to be weakened and we also have the social welfare measures which are also going to be sidelined. So, there is a need for the protest by the masses and they are going to be concerned about uh, the general understanding about uh, the development of the rural society and that we try to see it in terms of the agrarian agitations which took place. And as I referred earlier that we try to see that the most of the cases we try to see that these were basically found in those areas where the high productivity in terms of agriculture was going to be an important issue. And in that way if you try to see we try to find that the movement has shown its presence in Punjab, it has shown its presence in Haryana. Western UP, then we try to see Maharashtra and also we try to see the state of Karnataka. So, we try to see that uh, those states or those uh, spaces where we have the understanding of uh, the 
high productivity in terms of agriculture practices, we try to see the emergence of the farmers movement. And we try to see that uh, it was basically seen as that how the various farmers movement are representing the true color of the farmers movement at their own level. Especially if you try to see Maharashtra, so you have the Shetkari Sangathan which is going to be important. If you try to see Western UP, we have the presence of BKU which was visible in Punjab and Haryana to a greater extent. And also if you try to see the KRRS, so we have the Karnataka Rajya Riyadh Sabha which was been seen as part of the Karnataka state. So, I think uh, in most of these places we try to see that the important organizations which are seen as the promoter and as the symbol of farmers movement are going to be important. And in that way we try to see that how the farmers movement are being categorized in terms of the new social movement. Now, what is going to be more important is that why they are called as the new farmers movement. Why they are called as the new farmer movement and this has been nicely talked about by Tom Brass in 2000. So, Tom Brass has uh, spoken at length about the newness of the farmers movement. That what is new about the farmer movement, the newness of the farmers movement. The first thing is that it was been led by the rich farmers. So, it was been led by the rich farmers that is the first characteristics which make it to be the new. Then second thing was the non-political form. The non-political form of the farmers movement in terms of mobilization that is going to be important which make it to be new. And then we try to see that uh, these are to be seen in terms of the movement which put the state as the target which put the state at the target. So, it was basically fighting against the state. So, it was the agitations which were basically against the state, the policies of the state which are going to be important. And then we are also trying to see that the farmers they were trying to see in terms of the unification and they are to be seen as the commodity producers who are basically fighting for the cause of the product. So, we have the community producers who are engaged in the farmers movement and they are not to be seen on the class lines. So, the class character in the farmers movement is going to be missing. And finally, we try to see that it is the question of the demand for the remunerative prices. which is going to be prime with regard to the understanding of the newness of the farmers movement. And when we try to see, I think uh, we can try to speak about the farmers movement in terms of uh, the specific character like we said that uh, it has basically shown its emergence in the late 1970s and 1980s onwards we try to see the emergence of the so called farmers movement in India. And I think uh, when we try to speak about that, we also try to speak in terms of the fact that it was trying to have the specific leadership and we have the prominent case studies which can reflect upon that what were the farmers movement which have taken place in the Indian setup. And uh, in that way if you try to see, we try to find out that uh, sometimes it was not the Marxian analysis which is going to be important, rather it was also the question of patriotism which is going to be important especially when we try to speak about the Shetkari Sangathan and there the issue was the divide between what we say India versus the Bharat. India versus the Bharat that was going to be an important issue which we will talk in the later phase. So, we try to see that uh, the so called farmers movement are basically to be seen as located in the specific setting. And especially when we try to speak about the fact, we try to say that the Shetkari Sangatan, where we have the leadership by Sharad Joshi. 
so we have the shetkari sangathan which was been led by sharad joshi then we have the bku which was led by ms tiket so ms tiket was the ruler uh, rural leadership and also we have in the bku the contribution of ajmer singh and also we have the lakhowal and balbir singh they were the leaders which have shown their presence especially uh, in the areas of haryana and punjab and they try to see that how the bharti kisan union is going to have its uh, far reaching effects and especially we have the contribution of uh, the various leaders across the state and uh, the movement was not simply restricted to the specific state it sometimes it has been seen to have its spread effect across the nations and uh, these movements sometimes they had their appeal the global appeal which one can say and these appeals are going to be more significant because somewhere we try to see that the pressure is coming from the outside also and that is basically trying to affect and influence the state so specifically if we try to go let us try to talk about the state of uttar pradesh where we have the bku movement bharatiya kisan union movement bharatiya kisan union movement and that has been led by ms tiket now here if you try to see this movement has basically shown its significance in the late 1980s especially the contribution of lokdal uh, to some extent has try to see the political formation of the farmers and that lokdal has gradually taken the shape under the leadership of charan singh choudhry charan singh and choudhry charan singh was to some extent responsible for certain amount of mobilization and fighting for the dignity of the farmers so we try to see that uh, there were some initial initiatives which have given a proper shape towards the understanding of uh, the farmers movement although we try to associate the contribution of lokdal and the charan singh towards the bku movement but it is again not very correct because the bku has come little later and we try to see that bku is a movement which has the non political character because it was not been supported or was been guided by the ideology of the lokdal so that way if you try to see uh, the bku has shown its presence in terms of the specific movement which was trying to focus upon certain issues and what were the issues uh, which has been talked about is the reduction of the reduction of the electricity tariff that is one important con uh, concern and apart from that the increase of the procurement price increase of the procurement price that has to be seen seriously and apart from that the waiving of the debt waiving of the debt is going to be important and we try to see that uh, the uttar pradesh especially the location of uh, this movement was near and in and around the delhi so anything and everything which happens sometimes it, it has a bearing on the capital city and we try to see in many of the cases we try to find out that uh, the leaders were directly approaching the center and trying to influence upon them in terms of uh, their connections in terms of their traditional leadership now if you try to see uh, the contribution of uh, ms tiket we try to find out that uh, it was more based on the specific lineage that is it was based on the khap panchayat lineage and basically the jat lineage was going to be influential where we have the understanding in terms of the bhai chara so the connectivities was seen more in terms of uh, the kinship network the lineage which is going to be important and that makes this uh, movement to be more traditional and also more stronger 
because the ties were sometimes by blood or by relations. So, the relationships were involved and that has given the strength to this particular movement. On the other hand, if you try to see the contribution of uh, the state of Karnataka in terms of uh, the movement, especially we have the Karnataka and we also try to see the Karnataka state having certain amount of leadership which is coming from Karnataka Rajya, Karnataka Rajya Rait Sangh. that is K R R S. So, Karnataka Rajya Rait Sangh was seen as instrumental in terms of forming a powerful farmers lobby and which was basically trying to build up the leadership and we try to see the involvement of uh, H S Rudrappa. The involvement of H S Rudrappa who was seen as one of the freedom fighter in the history of Karnataka and uh, how he has been the doyen in the field of the farmers movement. And the Rudrappa's contribution was to be seen in terms of the leadership because he was been treated like the Gandhi in the state of Karnataka. So, his stretcher in that sense is going to be quite prime when he was trying to understand the dynamics or the change which has taken place. And I think when we try to see uh, this movement, uh, we try to see that uh, the important issue which was been involved is with regard to the sugar cane price. So, the sugar cane price was going to be an important issue and the farmers were basically trying to speak about the welfare of those who are basically practicing the sugar cane. So, the exploitation of the sugarcane farmers in the state of Shimago was going to be an instrumental issue and in 1970s we tried to find out that it has its effect and spread in the whole of Karnataka. And we try to see that how uh, H S Rudrappa is trying to mobilize basically with regard to the sugarcane prices which are being taken up. Later on we try to see that the contribution of uh, Nanduja which is going to be important, Na, Najunda Swami, how Najunda Swami is going to play a crucial role and also we have G. Patil whose contribution is going to be significant with regard to the KRRS movement. Now, they have carried forward the legacy of uh, the Rudrapa leadership and we try to see that they have adopted more radical approach as compared to the leadership of Rudrappa. So, we try to see that they have been replaced by Nagjuda Swami and also by Gauda Patil and these leaders were trying to uh, give a different flavor to the KRRS movement because the previous leader was trying to see it more in terms of the Gandhian strategy, but they were trying to be more uh, harsh and more straightforward in trying to fight against the issues. And their basic concern was with regard to challenging the pre-budget session especially trying to wave off or trying to wave off the depth and also trying to uh, speak about the price of the uh, sugar cane and also they were attacking upon the fertilizers prices and also trying to speak about certain issues uh, which are basically leading to certain uh, relaxation to the people practicing the sugar cane cropping. So, we try to see that certain amount of uniformity with regard to the price of the fertilizers is going to be important and apart from that how these uh, sugar canes are to be properly paid. We try to see it more in terms of uh, certain amount of insurance to the farmers if the failure of that particular crop take place. So, we try to see that uh, we have the contribution of uh, Nanjuda Swami as one of the significant uh, leader uh, who has basically emerged and he tries to see the KRRS in terms of the strength towards the farmers movement. Then the next which we can see in terms of the contribution towards 
the farmers movement is we try to see in the state of Maharashtra and as I said earlier that we try to see that how Maharashtra has the leadership in 1970s by Sharad Joshi. So, Sharad Joshi was basically looking after the Shetkari Sangathan, Shetkari Sangathan which was seen as one of the farmers association working for the cause of the farmers of Maharashtra. And if you try to have a brief history about the Sharad Joshi, he was basically UN official, he was basically a bureaucrat, a UN official who has left his job and uh, after coming back from Switzerland, he has settled in India and has started pra practicing farming in the Pune district. So, farming in the Pune district for which has made him aware and concerned about the issues related to the farmers. And he was basically trying to hint upon certain specific issues, especially he was trying to focus upon the ecological farming, which is basically meant for uh, what I can say contributing towards the environment. And also he was speaking about the notion of women's emancipation. So, women's emancipation was another important issue which was been seen through this uh, movement that is the Shetkari Sangathan and the third concern in that sense was the cultural reform. So, if you try to see uh, the concern of uh, the Shetkari Sangathan, we try to find out that the Shetkari Sangathan has a very uh, unique uh, strategies and the concern especially the ecological farming was been uh, taken for promoting we have the women's emancipation that is going to be an important issue and also we try to see the cultural reforms that was the basic concern of this particular movement. And when we try to see further, we try to find out that the Shetkari Sangathan there the concern was more with regard to the growers of onion and sugarcane. So, the onion producers and the sugarcane producers they were basically the concern for the Shetkari Sangathan and their fight was basically for the procurement price and also for the remunerative prices. So, we try to find out that uh, Maharashtra also was showing a uh, certain uh, important uh, color towards the uh, farmers movement. And then if you try to see uh, quickly uh, the contribution of uh, the BKU in Punjab, we try to find out that it has its grounding in 1984, where we try to see that the BKU had started emerging in terms of a sharp party. And it was seen as a secular party, uh, which is not having a political line. It, so, it was a non-political entity and it was basically trying to agitate against the economic and the social issues. So, it was seen as a secular party which was fighting on the economic and the social issues and the basic concern was that it was even trying to have certain amount of uh, what you can say uh, resistance from what one can say the Kali Dal. So, they were having a bit uh, difference of ideological stance. Uh, with regard to the Akali Dal who was trying to put the BKU with themselves, but uh, BKU uh, uh, leaders did not want themselves to merge into the Akali Dal because they wanted to have the different ideology and also they wanted to have the different stance for looking to the things. So, we try to see that uh, uh, the leaders like Banbir Singh and Lokhanwal who were seen as the prominent leader of BKU in Punjab, they were the key players in mobilizing the masses, especially the farmers and here also if you try to see the food drains were seen as the important concern and uh, there the issue was again the remunerative prices and also we try to speak about that how we have the issues related to uh, the use of fertilizers, the control of the price of the fertilizers that is going to be important. And in that way, we try to see that uh, their contribution is again going to be significant. 
So, I think if you try to have the overall picture of uh, the various uh, farmers movement across the nation in the uh, different states and uh, that can be seen in terms of the specific case study and we try to find out that uh, these movements were basically uh, cutting across the boundaries especially when we try to see the issues concerned when we try to see the sort of agitations which have been involved I think they were basically trying to pinpoint uh, those issues uh, which are going to be sensitive to the majority. And we try to see that the important people who have basically uh, been related with regard to the studies on the farmers movement. One of course is Tom Brass contribution that is the farmers movement in India, the new farmer movement in India that of course is a important contribution which we can see with regard to the understanding of farmers movement in India. And apart from that we have the contribution by D. N. Dhanagre who also have contributed towards the understanding of uh, the Shetkari Sangathan in Maharashtra. We also try to see the contribution which has been taken place by people like Banaji who had tried to uh, understand the KRRS movement and also trying to have certain amount of comparison with the Maharashtra. So, we try to see that uh, uh, the studies which has been done by Dhanagre and Banaji have some bearings on the Maharashtrian movement and also we try to see that uh, the Shetkari Sangatan has been rightly placed by these scholars in a specific way. And uh, apart from that uh, if you try to see the new farmers movement that has taken place I think people they try to understand the farmers movement in a very new dimension especially if you try to uh, quote the work of Gail Omvet. So, Gail Omvet was basically speaking about that how we can see the farmers movement in terms of the rich peasants movement which is to be seen in terms of the Kulak lobby that is the rich present. So, the Kulak lobby was seen as uh, the part of the new farmers movement and if we say that sometimes we try to hint to the fact that uh, uh, Gail Omvet was trying to speak about the class character in the farmers movement and uh, the basic reason was that since the demand was for the price or it was basically for the crops, the specific crops and it has lesser concerns with the present in terms of the individual growers rather they were to be seen in terms of proprietors. So, the present proprietors are going to be more uh, crucial and the price fixing was with regard to the agriculture price commission which has failed to uh, take care of the commodity prices of the products. So, we try to see that uh, uh, Gail Omvet was trying to pinpoint the class character of so called uh, the farmers movement and then we try to see another important contribution which is to be seen in terms of uh, uh, contribution of farmers movement is Lenny Berg's argument on farmers movement especially the Shetkari Sangathan. So, Shetkari Sangathan was been seen as an important uh, political consequences of the rural development. So, political consequences of the rural development which we try to see in terms of uh, the middle peasantry. So, we try to see that uh, it was the middle peasantry in terms of class which was going to play a crucial role in the Shetkari Sangathan and uh, Lenneberg was trying to highlight that it also reflects certain amount of class dimension in the farmers movement. And then we have the contribution of Rudolf and Rudolf. Rudolf and Rudolf uh, who tries to see that uh, the new farmers movement was basically seen as the middle peasant thesis. The middle peasant thesis and it basically reflect upon the small scale producers which are going to have the demand for the price in the contemporary Indian politics. And this movement was basically having an important concern and the concern was basically to be seen in terms of the middle peasantry who were basically been the 
principal beneficiaries of the price hike. Especially we try to see the extension of agriculture in terms of irrigation or we try to see the advent of the green revolution. Now, who are the people who are going to be benefited? So, it was basically these people who had a control over the irrigation, who are having the facilities of green revolution, they are going to be the promoters and the participant of the so called farmers movement. So, sometimes uh, Rudolf has put a right term that trying to speak about these producers as the Bullock capitalist. the Bullock capitalist rather than calling them as the rich farmers. So, we try to see that uh, it was the Bullock capitalist who are basically uh, also cultivating the land and they were basically seen as the Bullock capitalist and on the other hand the rich farmers which are seen as the absentee farmers which does not have much concern about uh, the agriculture practices. So, it was basically the involvement by the Bullock capitalists who were part of the middle peasantry and which were basically the initiator and the carrier of the farmers movement in India. And now, if we try to see further, especially when we try to enter into the global era, we try to see that how this shift has taken place as I shared earlier that uh, uh, these movements were basically having uh, a global appeal and especially when we try to see the resistance which is coming from the WTO and with regard to the general agreement on trade and tariff that is GATT, we try to find out that uh, many players have come into the picture and the rich uh, farmers basically the peasant which have been shifted towards the farmers. So, these farmers were trying to show certain amount of movement at the global level and either it is the question of uh, uh, what against the fighting against the Dunkel proposal or we try to see that how uh, the issue of uh, the cropping in terms of price that is the procurement price is going to be important and we try to find out that this has led to a different uh, what you can say a fight of protest a different lines of protest uh, which has come into existence especially we try to see that it has been marked by the militant character which basically reflect the fact that the militant culture and the militant character is going to be important with regard to the emergence of uh, the farmers movement with regard to the uh, globalization. And we try to find out that now the issue is going to be more with regard to the fight against the western paradigm. Western paradigm of development that is going to be overthrown or it is going to be seriously affected and also we try to see that how the role of the multinationals are going to be challenged. So, we have the multinational corporations and how these multinational corporations are going to be challenged by these new farmers movement. So, now we try to see a gradual shift which has taken place is that now it is a shift which has taken place from agriculture to agribusiness. So, we have agriculture and now we are trying to speak about the agribusiness which is going to be an important issue and for that I think uh, the whole debate with regard to the farmers protest and also the fight for the uh, cause of the rural or the countryside. Uh, Vanna Shiva definitely uh, is the uh, leading figure uh, who try to be seen as the activist and the promoter of uh, the movement against the globalization. And I think uh, in many of the instances uh, the writings of Vanna Shiva basically speaks about the crisis which is emerging in the rural society owing to the uh, globalization, especially when we try to see the effect of the green revolution and that has been shared by Vanna Shiva that how green is the green revolution. Basically, we try to see that how green is the green revolution is going to be an important issue because uh, she tried to see it in terms of the red color in the development which basically 
is an indicative of the fact that uh, it is basically involving certain amount of sacrifices, the sacrifices of the nature, the sacrifice of the nature, it is basically the uh, murdering of uh, the nature which is going to be there, especially when we have the question of the hybrid seeds. So, the hybrid seeds is going to be fighting against the nature and that is how we try to see the shift which has taken place with regard to the understanding of the effect of the globalization on the rural society. Now, I think uh, when we have said these things, especially we try to see the transition, we try to see how the new structural adjustment programs are going to come, which we try to see in terms of structural adjustment programs, which played a crucial role with regard to the understanding about the rural society. Similarly, the new, new players which are coming in terms of the World Bank or we have the FAO. So, these are the uh, crucial bodies which has come into picture and they were basically trying to uh, see the rural side, the countryside in a specific way, especially the concern was for talking about uh, those population uh, which were basically seen as the object and how they are basically to be seen as an active players. So, I think the concern was more towards uh, trying uh, to speak about that how the farmers are to be seen as the lively entities and they are basically trying to have their power to sh uh, say no and they can be seen as the people who are basically having certain amount of resistance. So, one can say that uh, these sort of farmers movement which are basically seen as the outcome in the late 1980s and 19 onwards especially the globalization which has given a new flavor uh, to the farmers movement basically adds to the new dimensions also. Uh, basically when we try to speak about the implications of uh, the so called globalization, we also try to see that as the capitalism, the so called uh, advanced form of capitalism has entered into the agriculture that what we try to see in terms of agribusiness, we try to see that it was having an ill effect and those ill effect are to be seen in terms of what? in terms of the new debates which are coming out especially we try to speak about the farmers suicide. So, this is going to be a growing concern uh, which is happening in the rural society especially when we try to speak about the farmers suicide. Uh, it basically indicates the lacunas which are associated with the state to regulate and monitor the needs of the masses and if you try to see in that sense we try to find out that the farmer suicide, the cultivator suicide which happened in the countryside and which is uh, going to uh, be an instrumental issue with regard to uh, putting a severe crisis to the situation of the agriculture is going to be taken up seriously by the state government. And uh, many times we try to find out that the states in Maharashtra or we try to see in Karnataka or for that sake in Punjab where the uh, farmer suicide rate is quite high that indicates that the rich farmers and the farmers movements sometimes they have to think seriously about the concern for the people who are basically into cultivation and practicing agriculture. So, we have to see that uh, these uh, movements definitely they have the specific agendas, they were to be seen in terms of the new social movement but we have also to see that how detrimental they can be to fight for the cause of the farmers in the true sense. Basically, we have to uh, cater to the basic idea that how much we are in a position to safeguard the interest of the farmers, especially we try to see in terms of the crop failure where the state is going to be helpless. So, we have to see those concerns where actually the cultivators, the farmers are going to have the sense of security. The sense of security in terms of what? Sense of security in terms of their uh, asset, in terms of their production and also in terms of their marketing. So, I think uh, uh, the time has come when the farmers movement has to uh, make a shift towards these aspects. Uh, in spite of speaking simply about the remunerative prices or trying to speak about the procurement prices 
or fighting for the cause of electricity, they have also to be seen in terms of fighting for the cause of the farmer suicide. So, I think uh, uh, this is where we have to locate uh, the new uh, what you can say beginning where the farmers movement can actually contribute in terms of their newness and that is how we try to see that the agitation, the rural agitation is not simply to resist, but they also should safeguard the interest of those who are basically seen as the cultivators. I think uh, for these works there are n number of studies especially as I said that Tom Brass new farmers movement in India is a collected essay which one can read and also uh, we can have the contribution by D. N. Dhanagre uh, who try to see Shetkari Sangathan as the new farmers movement in Maharashtra that of course is an going to be an important issue and apart from that we try to speak about the contribution of Gail Omvet in terms of farmers movement fighting for the liberation. So, I think uh, these are certain works and then we try to see Stefan Linderberg's contribution in terms of farmers movement and cultural nationalism. So, these are the issues, uh, these are the studies which tries to focus upon the contribution on farmers movement in India and with these uh, kind contributions and for the readings you can speak about the question of significance of the farmers movement. So, friends let us stop it here and we will continue with the new debates in the upcoming sessions. Thank you.